Chapter Twelve of Carpenter's Geographical Reader Asia by Frank Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Korea, the Hermit Nation. A short sail from Nagasaki brings us to Korea, or Chosen, as the country has been called since 1910, when it was made a part of the Japanese Empire we land at fusan and travel northward by railway to seoul the capital city the country is very mountainous with many streams and we are told that it contains gold silver copper and lead and that in the north there are large deposits of coal the soil seems to be fertile we pass fields of rice cotton and tobacco and find that wheat barley and millet are grown farther north fruits of many kinds are brought to the train and we buy ripe red persimmons as big as the largest tomato and eat them with spoons the climate is delightful and we do not wonder that the people are proud of their country on our way we pass many villages of mud and stone huts roofed with straw inhabited by farmers and now and then go through a town made up of houses of much the same nature there are white-clad figures at work in the fields and stopping off at one of the towns we find ourselves among some of the queerest people we shall see in our travels through asia they are not chinese and still they are yellow they are not japanese although their eyes are like almonds in shape they are taller than any of the asiatics we have in america and their faces are kinder and somewhat more stolid they have cheekbones as high as those of an indian and their noses are almost as flat as a negro's they are stronger than the men we saw in japan here comes one trotting along with a cartload of pottery tied to his back during our travels through the mountainous parts of the interior men of that kind will carry our trunks weighing hundreds of pounds for a few cents a day they will fasten them to an easel-like framework of forked sticks which hangs from their shoulders and will trot up the hills as though they were loaded with feathers they are korean porters who notwithstanding the railroads still carry much of the freight as we continue our travels we find that korea has many classes of people corresponding to those which were here before the japanese took possession of the country at the close of the russian japanese war and introduced western ways for ages prior to that time the nation was independent being under a king and the nobles who lived in great luxury by taxing and oppressing the rest of the people they strutted about in gorgeous silk gowns and spent their whole time in smoking and chatting considering it beneath their dignity to do any manual labor in addition to them there were other classes who dressed in gowns of cotton and silk these were government clerks scholars farmers merchants and laborers each class of which had its own costume and ways even today most of the people wear gowns and many of the men in the fields are clad in white cottons others have on full pantaloons tied in at the ankles and stockings of cloth so padded that they almost burst the low straw shoes which they wear we see gowns of light green and rose pink and some as blue as the sky but queerest of all to our eyes is the headgear some of the men wear bowls of white straw as big as umbrellas and others have their heads almost bare save for the little hats of black horsehair which sit on the crown and are fastened by ribbons tied under the chin the horsehair hat is that of a gentleman and it is prized more highly than any other article of dress it is so light that it seldom weighs more than two ounces and according to its shape one may know the class of its owner indeed here every style of hat has its meaning observe that one of bright straw which is coming towards us it is as big as a parasol and seems to be walking off with the man who is half hidden beneath it that hat is worn by a mourner and for three years he can use no other kind he wishes to appear humble for he believes that the gods are angry with him in that they cause the death of his father for the same reason he is clad in that gown of light gray and holds a screen in front of his face to show his great grief if at the end of his mourning his mother should die he must mourn three years longer and during the time he will not dare to go to parties 
and he should not do business or marry but here come two men with no hats at all they part their hair in the middle and it hangs in long braids down their backs see how meek they look and how they slink along half ashamed they are korean bachelors and until they are married they will have no rights that any one is bound to respect according to the old custom married men only might have hats in korea and it was only they who had the right to put up their hair in a top-knot on the crown of the head many unmarried men and boys still wear their hair down their backs they tie it with ribbons and look more like girls than boys we ask the guides to show us the women he tells us that korean ladies are seldom seen on the streets and that it is only lately that they have gone out at all except in closed carriages he points out however some queer-looking creatures who have green cloaks thrown over their heads which they hold tight in front of the faces with just a crack for the eyes these are women of the poorer classes many of whom turn their backs as we see them at work in the fields all these strange customs are changing and the koreans under the japanese have begun to adopt modern ways many of the town people now cut their hair short and the public schoolboys are required to do so the women are gradually coming out of their seclusion and we shall meet many girls on the streets going to school but we are now approaching the korean capital and can see its walls climbing the hills in the distance the city lies in a basin surrounded by mountains which in some places are as arid and ragged as the wildest peaks of the rockies and in others as green as the blue ridge or the adirondacks it is surrounded by a great wall as tall as a three-story house and so broad at the top that two automobiles abreast could easily be driven upon it the wall was built for the defense of the city about five hundred years ago but it is in good condition today the railroad station is outside the gates and before going in we climb to the top of the wall for a bird's eye view of the city what a curious sight imagine three hundred thousand people living in one-story houses picture sixty thousand houses most of which are of stones and mud with roofs of straw thatch think of a city where the men are dressed in long gowns and where until recently the ladies were never seen on the streets and you have some idea of seoul as we look out over the city it makes us think of a meadow filled with haycocks interspersed here and there with tiled barns and with groups of more imposing barns in a park in the centre and also under the mountains at the back the haycocks are the huts of the poor the heavy roofed barns are the homes of the rich and the great wooded enclosures surround the king's palaces the rich live in large yards back from the street and their houses are much like those of japan the rooms are separated by movable walls backed with oiled paper they are heated by flues which run under the floor the huts are built in the shape of a horseshoe with one heel of the shoe resting on the street and the other running back into the yard the doors of such houses are often so low that one must stoop to go in and at the foot of each door is a hole cut out for the dog every korean house has its own dog which knows a foreigner by his smell and barks at him as he goes through the street but let us take our field glasses and look again at the city below us as we examine it in detail we can see here and there many foreign buildings rising above the thatched huts some of these are government offices and others are schools in the centre is a red brick structure devoted to the y m c a which was built for the koreans by an american and at one side of the town close to the wall is a section filled with japanese houses in which are many japanese stores other modern buildings are now going up the whole city is changing and the time may come when the thatched huts will disappear and buildings like those of japan take their places End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Business Among the Koreans Education 
our travels this morning will be in the city of seoul a korean who speaks english acts as our guide we take chairs for one part of the journey and for others dismiss our coolies and ride about on the electric street cars we go through the wide avenues which cut the city in quarters and spend some time wandering about the side streets we start out early and for the first hour or so find the town full of smoke each of the huts has a chimney which juts forth into the street about two feet from the ground the people use straw for fuel and the smoke is now pouring forth for all soul is cooking its breakfast it makes our eyes smart and we have to look sharp to keep out of the way of the porters and others who are going to the markets at the foot of the chief business street we follow the crowd and soon find ourselves near the gate through which we came into seoul and at one of the busiest places in korea here are thousands of men in all sorts of costumes buying and selling there are booths devoted to rice and others in which corn wheat and barley are sold some of the market men have fresh fish from the sea and some sell beef mutton venison and all kinds of game we see many fresh vegetables and not a few peddlers who have baskets of red peppers before them little boys go about selling candies which they carry on trays attached to their waists by ropes over the shoulders other little ones have chestnuts which they roast upon pans of charcoal and sell piping hot many of the articles in the market seem to us very curious eggs for instance are sold by the stick ten being laid end to end and wrapped around with long straw so tightly that they stand out straight and stiff a stick of ten eggs brings five cents among other odd things are the tobacco pipes most of which have stems as long as ourselves to have a long pipe is a sign of a gentleman it shows that he has a servant for he cannot reach out to the bowl with the pipe stem in his mouth and therefore must have someone to light it and then the brass bowls used for cooking and eating utensils they shine like gold and are among the most beautiful wares in the market see that man in the white gown and black hat with those wooden clubs piled up around him they look like baseball bats and we wonder if our great american game has not come out to korea we ask the guide and he tells us that the club here holds the place that the flat iron has in america the family washing is done in cold water and dried on the grass each garment is then taken into the house and wrapped around a stick this is then laid upon the floor where one or two women squat down before it and pound upon the cloth with these wooden clubs until they make it as smooth and as glossy as could be done in an american laundry our guide points to his own gown of snow white and says it was ironed that way as we go on through the city we hear the song of these ironing clubs it is a musical rat-tat-tat which may be heard at every hour of the day and during the greater part of the night the clothes are ripped apart before they are washed it takes a long time to iron them and after that they must be sewed together again so you see the korean women have plenty to do leaving the market we walk through the crowd up the street until we come to a little temple which contains the great bell formerly used for opening and closing the gates this is the business centre of the native city the streets surrounding it being thronged with merchants and peddlers with dandies and loafers from sunrise to sunset the stores are wide open and the merchants sit inside them wearing white gowns and black hats most of them smoke as they wait for the customers running in from the streets here and there are little bazaars or covered alleys in which are more stores the merchants sit cross-legged on ledges in front and bring out the goods from behind as the customers order they seem in no hurry to sell and are content to smoke and chat if no buyers come they do not like to sell much to one man for they say if they should dispose of all their goods they could not keep open their stores there are many small shops scattered throughout the business streets there are sections devoted to the making of furniture and especially to the brass-bound cabinets for which these people are famous we find many stores where jewelers are working and some in which men are carving seals for every korean has a seal in order to stamp or sign any paper he writes in addition to its native shops seoul has now many japanese stores 
the japanese are opening mercantile establishments in all the cities and they do much of the business they control to a great extent the exports and imports and collect all the customs from them we learn that the trade of korea is growing and that it now amounts to some millions of dollars a year the principal exports are rice beans cowhides and cattle and also gold and coal the largest gold mines of the country are owned by americans who were the first to mine here with modern machinery but suppose we visit the schools they have been greatly changed within recent years and those most common today are much like the schools we saw in japan the children have uniforms and each boy has a little brass badge on his cap which marks the school to which he belongs the boys wear their hair short instead of in long braids down their backs and the girls have no veils which is contrary to the ideas of the older koreans the government school buildings have furniture like ours and each has its gymnasium where the children play and exercise every day the koreans are intelligent and most of the girls and boys are good students the japanese are building roads everywhere they have railroads and telegraph lines connecting all the chief towns and have established post offices they are also improving the harbors and building lighthouses along the coast the capital is now lighted by electricity and one can telephone from there to chimolpo and other towns daily newspapers are now printed in seoul and the people are alive to the advantages of the new civilization the japanese have long felt they must have korea as it is so close to their country that it might form a good place for any other nation to send in an army to fight against them this would be especially so with the chinese or russians whose possessions are not far away for this reason after the russian japanese war was over the japanese insisted that they should have control of korea and it is now a part of their empire they appoint the police and really govern the country they have built several great barracks at yongsan near seoul where a large force of japanese soldiers is quartered leaving the capital we make some trips here and there over the country passing through thousands of rice fields and now and then skirting the wilds into which we dare not go after dark for fear of the tigers we stay at night at korean inns where we sleep on brick floors half baked by the straw fires of the flues which run under them we travel on ponies and spend much time in the mountains we visit the copper mines and the gold mines and then go to songdu and pingyang two large cities the scenes of which are not unlike those of seoul from pingyang we take the railroad and travel northward through much beautiful country in Wiju on the yalu river we are now on the edge of manchuria and ready to enter the great world of china end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b china the chinese occupy about one-fourth of all asia their possessions consist of china proper and the vast tributary provinces of mongolia tibet and chinese turkestan comprising altogether an area larger than europe this country is bordered on the south by indochina and india on the north by siberia and on the west by other provinces of asiatic russia on the east for three thousand miles it is washed by the pacific ocean from which the land slopes gradually upward until it ends in the vast plateaus which form the heart of the continent the land is thus one of mountains and plains it has several low ranges running across it and between them mighty rivers which have so many branches that china proper is one of the best watered parts of the earth the yangtze kiang or blue river is to china what the mississippi is to our country it is navigable for steam vessels for one thousand miles from its mouth and the huang ho or yellow river which sluggishly flows through the great plain farther north although not navigable in places from its wide shifting channel is almost as large in addition to these there are other great rivers and countless canals so that most parts of the lowland can be reached upon boats 
moreover the country is such that railroads can be easily built within recent years some long trunk lines have been constructed and in time china will have a network of steel tracks such as we now have at home the cars are quite comfortable and many of our journeys will be made upon them china has mighty resources its mountains contain rich beds of minerals including gold silver nickel copper and tin and its coal and iron deposits are unequalled by those of our country the soil is so rich in many places that it yields three crops a year much of the land is irrigated and the rich earth washings of the mountains brought down by the rivers are carried through the canals over the land making it produce many fold indeed china has such varied resources that if it were walled off from the rest of the world its people could satisfy their every need from within their own boundaries in addition to this the country has an excellent climate although this differs according to the locality as much as that of the united states on the high plateaus of the west and north it is as cold and dry as in any part of the rockies and in the south it is as warm and moist as louisiana or florida wheat barley and millet thrive in the north while in the south rice and cotton are among the principal crops on the cold highlands the people wear sheepskins in winter and on the southeastern coast they can go barefooted at christmas the rainfall is varied the winds blowing in from the ocean meet the cold air of tibet and drop their burden of moisture so that the main body of china has plenty of water going on westward the still colder air wrings the winds drier and drier until when they reach the high plateaus they have no more rain to give hence we find there vast deserts such as those of gobi and tibet and the arid lands farther west you would naturally expect a rich country walled in by mountains and seas from the rest of the world to have a race and civilization of its own this is the case with china it contains more than four hundred million people who have a character and customs unlike those of other races and who had created a civilization long before the time of athens or rome this civilization until within a few years was not affected by ours but now the chinese are adopting the best things of europe and the united states they are building railroads introducing machinery and making other changes similar to those we saw in japan nevertheless the old china is still everywhere present and our travels will be like going through a new world we shall begin our investigations in the northern part of china we go back to seoul and from there to chimulpo where we take ship for tianjin the chief port of north china the distance across the yellow sea is not long but we stop on the way at Dairen and port arthur in manchuria two little cities now controlled by japan from there we steam on not far from the coast and enter china by the little Pei river awaiting high tide to take us over the bar at its mouth the stream is narrow and winding the land is flat and the Pei curves in and out like a snake so that we can see both in front and behind us the white sails of chinese boats marching as it were over the fields as they move along through the river we are now in the great plain which extends from the valley of the yangtze to the mountains north of peking skirting the ocean and running back into the interior in places as far as four hundred miles the soil here is exceedingly rich and it is said that it supports more people than any other area of like size on the globe it is largely composed of a yellow earth known as loess which contains lime and decayed vegetable matter there are great beds of it in the mountains farther west which are supposed to have been made by the dust blown from the highlands of central asia these loess beds are very porous and the winds carry their dust over the great plain and the rivers also aid in distributing it making the land wonderfully fertile the chinese think so much of this fat yellow soil that one of the titles of their emperor who formerly ruled was huang ti which means lord of the loess and they chose yellow as the imperial color most of the great plain is low and as flat as a floor we can see for miles on all sides the country is made up of farms without fences 
and spotted here and there with small clumps of trees surrounding the mud villages which are the homes of the farmers the banks of the Pe river are dotted with little cities and villages we often float close to the houses they are almost all of one story and some of them are not more than fifteen feet square their walls are sun-dried bricks and their low slanting roofs are of reeds plastered with mud the houses are built close to the streets which are narrow dirt roads without sidewalks in some places the houses extend out over the banks of the river in such a way that the floods often wash out the foundations and drop them families and all down into the water the streets of these towns are swarming with yellow-skinned people we see merchants in black satin caps and gay-colored silk gowns and workmen in shirts and wide flapping pantaloons of blue cotton their queues are tied up to be out of the way we see bareheaded women in coats of green purple and crimson below which are bright-colored trousers and little silk shoes there are almond-eyed children dressed like their parents some playing about and others watching the steamer go by the poorer boys are more than half naked and we tremble at their danger as we see them wrestling together rolling each other over and over at the very edge of the water as we go in we observe that the roads which run from village to village are lined with people of all classes conditions and ages there are half-naked porters who go on the trot as they carry great loads balanced on the ends of poles which rest on their shoulders and we now and then pass ladies on their way to call on the neighbors their feet are too small for them to walk comfortably and they ride on the backs of their men servants they wear red or pink slippers and their little feet bob up and down out of silk pantaloons as they hold on to the necks of the bearers we see chinese gentlemen riding in sedan chairs slung between poles and small-footed old women who totter along with canes in their hands there are hucksters with baskets on their way to the markets and laborers and peddlers of every description we observe that hundreds are at work in the fields and get our first glimpse of the industry of the chinese which is unsurpassed in the world the numbers increase as we go up the river and at tientsin we find scores of brawny laborers ready to handle the freight at the wharves they carry the huge boxes and bales out of our ship all grunting and yelling together as they raise and lower their burdens as we look closely at them we are surprised at their strength they are taller than the people of the southern part of the country from where the chinese of america come some are six feet in height and some can lift five hundred pounds at a load tientsin is the new york of north china it is the chief port of the great plain with its many millions of people and also of mongolia to which country the goods are carried by railroads and camels it was tientsin which constructed the first working railroad of china and it now has trunk lines which connect it with peking and with mongolia manchuria and siberia and also with hankow nanking and shanghai and other cities in the rich yangtze valley tientsin is already as big as philadelphia and has many factories and schools its people are gradually introducing the ways of our civilization and as we go through our guides point out the changes saying that china will be soon as far advanced as japan we are anxious however to see the civilization of old china and tell our guides that we wish to travel in chinese style to peking they reply that the railroad will take us there in less than three hours but that in the old ways the journey will require several days we ask how we are to go they tell us we can have ponies or carts or if we would still go more cheaply there are plenty of wheelbarrows and do the chinese ever travel on wheelbarrows yes they are common all over the country vast quantities of goods are still carried across country upon them and some of the barrows have sails the pushers being helped on by the wind we shall find many with men and donkeys harnessed in front thus aiding the owner who stands between the handles and pushes hard behind the chinese wheelbarrow is different from ours the wheel is in the centre of the bed and there is a framework over it with a ledge on each side the passengers sit on the ledges or there may be a passenger on one side and freight on the other i have seen wheelbarrows with a hog or sheep tied to one side while on the ledge opposite rode a pretty chinese girl with flowers in her hair 
and rouge on her cheeks i try one of the wheelbarrows and conclude it will not do for us to risk an eighty-mile ride upon them and as the ponies are shaggy and rough we tell our guides to order carts in time they come up each pulled by two dirty mules harnessed one in front of the other and driven by a chinese who sits on the shafts what clumsy vehicles they are the wheels are twice as heavy as those of our drays and the shafts are as thick the bed rests on the shafts without springs and over it is a framework covered with blue canvas forming the roof of the cart this is too low for us to have seats beneath it and we get in and sit on the floor there is no support for the back and when we attempt to lie down our feet extend out at the front disturbing the driver the mules start off on the trot and we are almost jolted to jelly by the ruts in the road the dust is so thick we can taste it our lips become dry and when we lick them they are straightway coated with clay we are tired out before we have ridden ten miles and are glad now and then to climb out for a walk we ask why there are no better roads and are surprised to learn that this is one of the best highways of china the country has four thousand roads but most of them have been so cut up by these heavy vehicles throughout the ages that they are no better than ditches they are filled with dust when the weather is dry and when wet they become rivers of mud we are told however that the people are beginning to want modern roads some of them have travelled abroad and at their advice the government is urging the provinces to improve the highways and most of the cities and towns are laying new streets we shall see stone crushers and steam rollers in peking and shall learn that new roadways are being made everywhere as we proceed we pass frequent villages the farmers do not live on their farms but in villages of squalid houses with fences of mud about them the buildings are of sun-dried brick roofed with reeds tied on in bunches over which mud is spread we stay overnight in one of these towns at a native hotel whose surroundings make us think of a barnyard our rooms are in stable-like sheds built around a court filled with donkeys and camels the donkeys bray at all hours of the night and the camels cry like so many babies our bed is a brick ledge about two feet high which fills one half of the room it is heated by flues running under it and we are alternately roasting and freezing the fuel is straw which burns out very quickly and the brick bed is stone cold before a new fire is lighted there are no springs and no bedding we turn over again and again and at daybreak get up with all our bones aching starting on at six in the morning we ride and walk until dusk when we find by the increased number of wheelbarrows donkeys and carts that we are approaching the great capital of china and far off in the distance we see the walls of peking our journey has lasted two days but we have had a taste of real china and the trip has been well worth the discomfort it cost End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the great capital of china peking is a walled city its million and a half population live in a vast enclosure bounded by walls so high that one would have to climb to the top of a tall tree to look over them think of surrounding new york or london by great walls sixty feet thick at the bottom as tall as a four-story house and so broad at the top that one could drive four wagon loads of hay side by side upon them without crowding let these walls be faced inside and out with gray bricks each as thick as a big dictionary and let the space between be filled with earth so packed that the ages have made the whole as solid as stone build great towers upon the top of the structure above the gates which go through it and you have some idea of peking such walls were originally built around every important chinese city and it is estimated that there are still more than a thousand walled cities in china the walls were put up as a means of defense and on many of them are piles of stones ready to be thrown down at the enemy in case of a siege the towers were intended for watchmen and the gates under them were the only way in they were open during the day 
and closed at night by doors plated with iron there are sixteen such gates leading into peking and we can see the towers over them long before we come to the walls entering one of the gates we climb up into the tower for a view of peking what a curious city it is like an immense orchard in which stand thousands of one-story stable-like structures of gray brick with roofs of black tiles the stores and homes of the people here and there are government buildings shaped somewhat like an american barn rising above the trees and through the hole are cut wide roads upon which moves a busy throng of vehicles animals and men as we look again we see that there are other walls running this way and that through the enclosure and our guides tell us that these walls surround three different cities the whole making peking there is the tartar city at the north and in its centre the imperial city which was built as the home of the emperor and its thousands of servants it has many huge buildings roofed with porcelain tiles of bright yellow there is the chinese city at the south and beyond it the temples of agriculture and heaven where the emperor rode out in an elephant cart to sacrifice and pray on behalf of the nation for many generations it was the custom for the emperor every spring to start the first furrow with a gold-handled plough after which the farmers would put in their crops it is in the chinese city that most of the business is done its streets are narrow and walled with all kinds of stores as we shall see when we go through them the tartar city gets its name from the tartars who came long ago from beyond the great wall and conquered the chinese they made their homes here and here their emperor lived it is still the seat of government but since nineteen twelve when the imperial government was overthrown most of the officials have been chinese but let us go down from the tower and make our way through that crowd of pushing men and beasts which moves through this gate from sunrise to sunset what a wonderful collection it is there are caravans of brown woolly camels laden with tea on their way to mongolia and ridden by fierce-looking tartars there are carts without number containing the silk-dressed nobility and common workmen or coolies half naked on foot there are little gray donkeys by hundreds straddled by yellow-skinned merchants and urged on by the blows of yellow-skinned donkey boys who follow behind there are sober-faced scholars wearing spectacles the glasses of which are as big as our silver dollars and dandies dressed in satins and silks there are shaven-headed priests from tibet in gowns of bright yellow and travellers from all over china in costumes of all shades and tints there are barefooted beggars in rags and gorgeously dressed princes on ponies all pushing and scrambling and shouting as they force their way through the busiest parts of the cities have similar crowds and we hire donkeys in order to ride through the streets now we are mounted and are forcing our way in and out through these yellow-skinned people we move carefully and have little trouble the chinese have become accustomed to foreigners and are gradually adopting the ways of our civilization there are policemen at all the street crossings and good order is everywhere kept we observe that many of the streets are now paved and that they have sidewalks and roadways we see automobiles flying by the camels on the chief thoroughfares and notice that electric lamps have taken the places of the paper lanterns used in the past suppose we enter a store it has counters behind which the clerks stand and upon which they display their goods the clerks wear long gowns of silk and black skull caps with red buttons on top they keep their caps on in the stores we find them good salesmen although they always ask several times what they think we will pay going on we pass banking establishments and at the street corners see money changers sitting at tables with piles of copper and brass coins before them such coins form the chief money of china and it takes several of the kind known as cash to equal the value of one of our cents i give you here a picture of myself and my chinese servant holding some strings of coins the total value of which is not more than ten dollars many large transactions are still carried on in silver by weight such silver is cast in the shape of a chinese shoe and marked with a number which shows the tails or chinese ounces it weighs 
a tail is worth a little more than our silver dollar in addition silver dollars are now being coined mints having been established in many of the cities the banks issue notes and such notes circulate almost everywhere we have now come into a street of bookstores and as we go on we observe that in some streets they are selling nothing but hats and that others are lined with shoe stores and fur stores there are sections of the city where only porcelain is sold and long lines of shops devoted to satins and silks the stores of the same kind are usually close together and there are lock peddlers by hundreds and wood stores and coal stores wood is sold by weight and coal dust is mixed with mud and made up into balls as big as our fists which are sold for a few cents apiece but here we are at a drug store that writing in front of it advertises ground tiger bones to strengthen faint hearts and extracts of rat meat which are warranted to make the hair grow farther on is a coffin street each store of which is full of great wooden caskets the chinese are particular as to how they are buried and they sometimes buy coffins a long time before death indeed it is not uncommon for a son to give his father or mother a beautiful coffin at new year's the parent will keep such a present in his parlor and show it with pride to the neighbors in the coffin street are shops which sell gold and silver paper cut in certain odd shapes this is funeral money to be burned at the graves of the dead that they may not go penniless into the land of the hereafter and then there are many bird stores in peking the chinese are fond of pets and we meet grown men going about carrying little birds upon sticks one leg of the bird is tied to the stick by a string which permits it to fly a short distance and it now and then darts up and flaps its wings before it returns to its perch we find pigeons sold in the markets and often hear them flying about through the air making a noise like a boy when he blows a tin whistle the noise comes out from a whistle of wood which is tied to the tail of the bird to scare off the hawks such whistles cost two cents apiece many of the pigeons are used as carriers the letters being tied under their wings the markets are especially interesting we have heard it said that the chief food of the chinese is rice cats dogs and rats but we observe that they have the best of meats and the choicest of fruits the mutton comes from the fat-tailed sheep of north china the tails of which often weigh several pounds each we can buy camel's flesh and pork is sold everywhere the chinese like pork and they have one variety which is especially fine being produced on an island off the southern coast where the pigs are fattened on sweet potatoes and chestnuts they have also fowls of every kind and the best breeds of geese chickens and ducks in addition to the animals reared for the markets china has all sorts of game we see deer rabbits and squirrels and snipe quail duck and other wild birds more than a thousand different kinds of fish are sold in the markets and there are mackerel herring sturgeon and sole as well as gold and silver fish and fish that look much like a parrot there are plenty of oysters and clams and also prawns shrimps and crabs the fish are all brought in alive and are kept in tubs of running water until they are sold as to cats dogs and rats they are sometimes eaten by the poorer chinese i once bought a dried rat in canton and i have visited restaurants which serve stews of cat meat and dog meat in one of them i saw a dog cooking the flesh looked like pork and the fur had been scalded and scraped from the skin with the exception of a tuft at the end of the tail this tuft was jet black and my guide said it was left on to show the dog's color as the meat of a black dog is considered the best end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the government and the schools until within a few years the chinese nation has been like one vast family of which the emperor was the head and therefore the absolute ruler the people have been slow to take up our civilization which as we have seen has so greatly changed japan and it is only within a short time that they have realized that our methods of government must be the best indeed it was not until china was conquered by little japan 
that she knew how backward she was and how unable to take the part she should hold in the world she then saw that she must have a different government and different ways of education commerce and industry for this reason the people overthrew the old empire and established a republic in its stead with a president and congress elected by the people the nation is rapidly changing and it is growing more and more like the rest of the civilized world in its customs it was in nineteen twelve that the emperor was forced from the throne as the result of a great revolution the new chinese president and the new chinese congress did not agree well before long the president dissolved the congress and governed almost as he pleased he even went out to the temples of agriculture and heaven to sacrifice and pray and plough as the emperor had done then in nineteen fifteen many people asked that the country should again be an empire but so many other chinese fought against this change that it was decided to continue the government as a republic we can now see the grand palaces of the emperor in peking there in the tartar city inside a walled enclosure known as the pink forbidden city this consists of a wilderness of high structures whose roofs of yellow tiles shine like gold under the sun the buildings run up and down both sides of a lake and they look out upon broad lawns and beautiful parks in which grow great forest trees many of the palaces of the emperor are now used as the official buildings of the new government some have been remodeled and in other places new buildings are going up in the past it was impossible for travelers to enter this part of peking but we can now go where we please and we shall visit the offices we find in them the men who are ruling china and learn about the great changes which are now taking place the president of the republic has a cabinet he has his departments of state treasury war justice and agriculture as well as those of public works education commerce and colonies some of the chief officials have been educated abroad and many in the united states our nation has always been friendly to china and the government is now sending many chinese boys to our american colleges we find friends in all the chief public buildings and are made quite at home in addition to the officials here at peking there are thousands scattered all over the country china proper has twenty-two provinces each of which has its own governor with hundreds of officials to help him each province is divided into districts and the districts into sub-districts and villages each village has its own officers and every family in it is responsible for its good conduct if a boy commits a crime his father his elder brothers and even his teachers are punished as well as himself for the chinese say that if they had taught him properly he would not have broken the laws by the new constitution every province now has its legislature or provincial assembly much as in the states of our union the cities elect their own mayors and many of them have night schools where grown men are now studying how a people should govern itself in the past the courts of china were corrupt the jails and prisons were vile places and the punishments were the most terrible that could be imagined these matters are being reformed new courts have been created new prisons are building and in time justice will be administered as fairly as in our own country at present some of the milder of the old punishments are still in use and as we go through the streets we may see petty thieves and vagrants wearing kangs the kang is a framework of boards about as big as the top of a square kitchen table this has a hole in the center and is so made that it can be opened and fitted tightly around the neck so that it rests on the shoulders it usually weighs about twenty five pounds and is sometimes loaded with iron to make it weigh more now if one will imagine his neck fastened through a hole in a kitchen table top which he is condemned to carry about with him he can see how he would be punished if he were caught stealing in china he would find it more uncomfortable than he could imagine the boards would extend so far out that he could not reach his mouth with his hands and would have to ask others to feed him he could not lie down and if a fly or bee happened to light on his nose he could dislodge it only by shaking his head upon the top of the kong on each side of the hole 
are pasted strips of paper describing the crime of the wearer so that every one can read them as the man goes through the streets during our stay in peking we meet many officials and scholars and observe that the chinese have in some respects a high degree of civilization they are philosophers and are always talking about morality virtue and justice they like to discuss things with us and we often find that they have the best of the argument they consider scholarship better than riches every one is anxious that his children should have an education and the boy who graduates well or passes a high examination is pretty sure to be employed by the government it is therefore the aim of every schoolboy to learn his lessons so well that he may become an official we find all sorts of schools in peking and shall meet with others everywhere throughout the country within recent years the old system of education which was made up almost together of writing essays and committing to memory the chinese classics has been abolished and the studies are now much the same as our own chinese boys and girls learn arithmetic geography and history and as they grow older they study the sciences there are many manual training schools technical schools and high schools and colleges china has schools of law and medicine and of agriculture engineering and commerce there are also large universities including one here in peking in these new schools the child starts in with the kindergarten at the age of three or four years it takes him about nine years to finish the lower grades and five more to go through the intermediate schools he is now ready for college and after that he may enter the university where he remains from three to eight years according to the course he has chosen in the public schools of the cities the children have desks and study and recite much as we do they wear uniforms and have a military drill similar to that of japan they have their games during recess and can play ball and wrestle as well as ourselves they learn easily and most of them are anxious to study when a boy starts to school for the first time he carries a red visiting card bearing his name and also a present for the teacher he bows to the teacher when he enters or leaves the room and as a rule is polite there are still old-fashioned schools in the villages where the pupils sit on the floor or on benches before little tables in such schools they study out loud shouting at the tops of their voices the words of the chinese classics they are trying to learn if a boy stops shouting the teacher concludes he has stopped studying and gives him a caning in the older schools they do most of their sums by means of a counting box like the japanese soroban this as we saw was a framework of wooden buttons strung upon wires every boy of ten or more knows how to use it and he can do sums upon it more quickly than we can figure them out with paper and pen until recently the chinese have not thought that women needed much education and but few girls went to school girls schools are now being established and in them the girls are taught the same as the boys they learn also music and drawing as well as nursing needlework and housekeeping in these schools the girls are required to unbind their feet they are not allowed to paint powder or to wear jewelry or expensive gowns they must have on the school uniform and do up their hair in a braid or plain coil their only ornaments being the rosettes which indicate the school to which they belong the new schools are performing a great work among the chinese and this is true not only in the way of ordinary education but also for the army in most of them the boys are taught to be soldiers they have their own guns and go through regular military exercises under officers who have been trained in japan america or europe moreover there are also government military schools so that china will soon have a great modern army its people are so many that it could put more soldiers into the field than almost any other nation on earth and some think that the chinese might conquer the world if they would in the past they have been often imposed upon by smaller nations and were badly defeated by little japan they are not cowards however and it may be different when they have learned our ways of fighting and of modern guns and war machines of their own End of chapter sixteen Chapter 17 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader. 
asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the great wall of china we start northward today to see the great wall of china we go upon donkeys for it is only on them that we can travel over the mountains upon which the structure is built we have learned something from our restless nights on the way to peking and we carry along extra bedding to soften the brick floors of the inns our donkeys are not much larger than newfoundland dogs the saddles are blankets to which the iron rings used as stirrups are tied with ropes the bridles have been added because we are foreigners chinese donkeys do not know the use of the bit and the people seldom have bridles the animals are directed this way and that by a blow on the neck with a club or they may be driven by boys who run behind with sticks in their hands in addition to these little beasts we have several mule litters to which we can change when tired of the saddle the mule litter is a kennel-like box covered with cloth slung between two thick poles about thirty feet long the poles stick out in front and behind forming shafts which are bound to the sides of the mules and in which they go single file the litter is open in front it is furnished with blankets and we can lie down while we are jolted over the road it takes us more than an hour to pass from the hotel in peking to the gates of the city going through them we find the road for a long distance lined with mat sheds and mud huts we next cross bridges of marble and then reach the old highway from peking to mongolia over which millions of dollars worth of goods are carried each year the feet of innumerable donkeys and tens of thousands of camels have cut up the earth so that the road has become little more than a wide ditch through the fields the rude carts have worn great hollows and ruts and we are often turned out of our way by pools of half liquid mud our animals get stuck in the mud up to their knees and they can make only three or four miles an hour in some places the road is so narrow that we are crowded out into the fields by the caravans of camels which in single file with soft velvety step move contemptuously along they are tied in companies of six by ropes fastened to sticks thrust through their noses about the neck of the last camel is a long iron bell as big around as a stovepipe which ding-dongs as he moves and announces to the mongolian driver that the section of his caravan is on the go each camel carries a box of brick tea strapped on each side his back and the boxes bob up and down as grumbling and whining he tramps sullenly on as we go farther north we meet more camels carrying coal in great bags we pass caravans of them almost a mile long and see them far away on the horizon forming a moving fence against the blue sky of north china we soon come to the hills and at last to the nankow pass over which the caravans cross the mountain range on their way to the north this pass is the chief line of travel and for more than ten generations it has been trodden by millions it is one of the roughest roads of the world on a trip to the great wall i once met a foreigner who had attempted to go through in a cart when he came to the mountains he was forced to hire a camel which carried the cart through on its back notwithstanding the roughness of the pass a railroad has been built over it this road starts at peking and extends northward into mongolia the intention being that it will eventually connect with the trans-siberian railroad thus giving another trunk line from china to europe we pick our way in and out among the stones for fifteen miles stopped now and then by droves of black hogs and sheep with fat tails we wind along the bed of a stream and at last get our first sight of the great chinese wall many times we think we have reached it when a sharp turn shows that it is still miles in the distance we can see it cutting its way over the mountains climbing the peaks and crawling as it were up the hills at last we reach the gate that leads through into mongolia and going off to the side find an inclined roadway up which we ride on our donkeys to the top of the wall to explore this wonderful structure the great wall was built by the chinese as a defence against the invasions of the tartar hordes from the north it begins at the sea 
and runs over the mountains clear across the northern boundary of china proper just south of the vast provinces of manchuria and mongolia until it reaches the desert of gobi north of tibet in a straight line it is more than twelve hundred miles long and with its windings it measures all told a distance of about fifteen hundred miles it is about twenty-five feet wide and thirty feet high it is composed of a mass of stone and earth mixed together and faced with walls of slate-colored brick the interior being so packed down and filled in that throughout much of its eastern portion it is as solid as stone near the city of shan hui kwan on the edge of the yellow sea a part of the wall has been thrown down and i there found that the brick outer facing was about three feet in thickness the bricks are fifteen inches long seven inches wide and a little more than three inches thick one which i brought with me back to america weighs twenty one pounds and five ounces the top of the great wall is paved with such bricks and upon its northern side throughout its entire length is a battlement behind which the chinese archers lay and shot at the tartars huge two-story and three-story towers are to be seen rising above the wall along a great part of it these towers are made of bricks similar to those just described they extend about forty feet above the top of the structure having many portholes through which one can see for miles over the country the wall is about ten feet narrower at the top than at the base but the top is so wide that the largest motor car could be easily ridden along its paved highway the great wall is just about as tall as a three-story house and its width is that of the average parlor now if you will imagine a solid line of three-story brick houses from fifteen to twenty feet wide built across the united states from new york to omaha you may have some idea of the size of the great chinese wall it would be far easier however for us to build such a line of houses than it was for the chinese to construct their mighty fortification our building line would cross new jersey and pennsylvania and cut the rolling plains of ohio indiana illinois and iowa where water is plentiful where there is much clay for brick and where the railroads could be used for carrying the materials this mighty structure was built right over the mountains it climbs the steepest of crags and in one place crosses a peak more than five thousand feet high in some parts there is no clay within thirty miles of it and many of the hills are so steep that the chinese had to tie the bricks to the backs of sheep and goats in order to get them up to the builders the bricks were molded by hand and as there are but few cattle or horses in china every foot of the wall was made without the aid of machinery the chinese historians say that it took an army of three hundred thousand men to protect the builders and that millions were employed in the construction they state also that the wall was begun and completed within the short space of ten years as we stand upon it we are impressed with the civilization these people must have had in those long ago days the great wall was built when our own ancestors were roaming through europe living in huts and sleeping on straw it was erected seventeen hundred years before america was discovered when rome was still a republic and none of the great nations of europe had yet come into existence end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b mongolia and manchuria we might continue our travels northward through the great wall and explore mongolia but to do so we should need a caravan of camels and the trip would last many months mongolia is one-third as large as the whole united states and most of it is composed of the high windy desert of gobi where one might wander for days without finding water we meet mongols at the pass through the wall they are on camels and are carrying brick tea north to urga their capital which is six hundred miles from where we are now they are a stout people with rosy faces of a copper color and features much like those of our indians 
they dress in sheepskins with the wool turned inward and have gowns and caps lined with fur the men women and children wear boots which reach to their knees and all look greasy and dirty there are several millions of these mongols they are a nomadic race who range the desert with their camels horses and sheep they dwell in circular tents of skins or felt stretched over a framework with a hole in the roof to let out the smoke their only furniture is small tables and the boxes or chests containing their clothing the latter being placed around the walls on the inside of the tent the mongols live largely upon mush and cakes made of the meal of millet buckwheat or oats mixed with milk they eat meat only on festal occasions killing a sheep when they have guests they do not use chopsticks but eat with their fingers and spoons they cook over the coals and a favorite dish is a soup made of milk and brick tea enriched with butter a far different country from mongolia is manchuria which lies to the east of it between korea and siberia it is a province of china and its people are largely of mongolian descent although they have mixed with the chinese and become semi-civilized they are taller and stronger than the chinese we see in america and more hardy than those of most other parts of the country there are about sixteen millions of them they have hundreds of villages and also cities of considerable size the largest being mukden situated in the heart of the province manchuria is one of the richest parts of north asia and it will at some time support many millions more people than now it is ten times as large as the state of indiana and its soil almost everywhere will raise wheat corn barley and oats it produces vast quantities of beans and especially a sorghum or millet the seed of which is the chief food of the people this crop grows eight or ten feet in height it looks like indian corn save that the grain is found at the top the stalks are cut off close to the ground and the seed is threshed out by a stone roller drawn by an ox donkey or mule which tramps around over the straw the grain is ground to a flour and is eaten like rice the fodder is used for feeding cattle and horses and also for fencing bridging and hut building the leaves are woven into mats and bags to hold grain while the roots are sometimes ploughed up and collected for fuel tobacco is grown in the northern part of the country and in the south are produced vast quantities of the silkworms which spin the coarse fibre from which pongee silks are made these worms do not feed upon the mulberry but upon the leaves of an oak tree which covers the hills of southeastern manchuria the trees being cut back every few years to furnish new growth the cocoons are shipped to japan and to chifu in china where the weaving is done in northern manchuria are great forests and pasture lands where the grass reaches a height of six feet compelling travelers to cut their way through here horses mules oxen sheep and goats are reared the land is rich in minerals having gold silver iron copper and lead indeed it should be one of the most prosperous parts of the world but suppose we make a short trip into manchuria and visit the capital we have returned to peking and taken the train which goes north through that country to the trans-siberian railroad forming a part of the trunk line from china to europe we ride all day across the great plain passing the kaiping coal mines about three hours from tientsin and stopping eighty miles farther on to look at the great wall of china where it ends at shanghai kwan on the edge of the sea the wall there is as strong as where we visited it at the nankow pass but a breach has been made through which our train goes leaving shanghai kwan we enter manchuria and travel all day over a rich country much less thickly settled than those parts of china where we have been we find soldiers at all the stations and in some sections there are guards on the cars this is to protect the passengers from the terrible wang hootsies tribes of brigands who sometimes rush forth and hold up the trains there are many such in northern manchuria they live in the forests from where they now and then make raids to rob or blackmail the people they force the villages to pay tribute and frequently take travelers captive and hold them for a ransom we are delighted with mukden 
it is not so large as peking but it has great walls about it and in its centre is a second enclosure surrounding the old palaces of the emperor and the new government offices as we have already learned the imperial family of china was of manchu or tartar descent the ancestors of the emperor having once lived in mukden the population of the country is now a combination of manchus and chinese and mukden has many tall broad-shouldered tartars who remind us of the mongols we saw along the great wall the manchu women are handsome they look us straight in the eyes their feet are not bound like those of the chinese women and they walk through the streets with firm tread among them are many rich ladies dressed in silk coats lined with fur which fall to the ankles and below which show out silk pantaloons they paint their faces white and tint the cheeks and eyelids with red they have gorgeous headdresses wrapping the hair around thin plates of gold or silver two or three inches wide and ten inches long in such a way that it stands out in wings on each side of the head their shoes are like stilts having a high support under the instep the children dress like their parents we spend much time walking the streets mukden has miles of one-story booths back of which are warehouses filled with fine goods there are long streets devoted to the making of ornaments of silver and gold and some to the manufacture of copper and brass there are streets of shoe stores with great boots hanging out at the front as a sign of the business and quarters where caps only are sold we see peddlers selling false hair to be braided into the queue to make it seem longer black silk is also used for this purpose mukden has many fur stores it has more than forty tanneries and leather and fur are to be seen everywhere the city is one of the chief fur markets of asia the forests of manchuria are full of wild animals and the raw skins and furs are brought here for sale among the furs are those of tigers and leopards sables beavers and wolves we see many dog skins and are told that there are dog farms where the animals are bred for their skins they are killed just before spring while their hair is still long the best skins make beautiful rugs and we learn that many of them are shipped to america during our stay in manchuria we take a trip north to harbin where we go through great flouring mills equipped with machinery made in our country harbin is in a rich grain raising region at the junction of the chinese eastern and the trans-siberian railroads it has many russians and we ride out in droskies to see the country about we also visit kirin another large town surrounded by forests it has sawmills and lumber establishments it is situated on the sungari river and is connected by railroad with the trunk line of the trans-siberian railroad end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chinese boats and boat people we have returned to peking and are on our way south to the valley of the yangtze we might have gone there by rail taking the road that crosses the great plain to han kao the chief commercial city of interior china lying on the yangtze six or seven hundred miles from the sea we prefer however to travel by boat as we wish to explore the grand canal built by the chinese centuries ago as their most important trade route this canal runs from tientsin about seven hundred miles southward to the rich city of hangchow which is southwest of shanghai it crosses the huang and the yangtze and other large streams cutting its way through one of the most thickly populated parts of the globe in some places it has followed the streams winding in and out for miles without locks in others where the land is low its bed is a raised earthwork walled on both sides with stones some of the embankments are twenty feet high and the stream they enclose is often two hundred feet wide there are many locks and the boats are dragged by men from one level to another at present the canal is going to ruin it is less and less used every year the boats for carrying the tribute rice to peking 
having been displaced by the railroads and by the steamers which go by sea to tientsin we find our journey delightful we pass many walled cities and towns and thousands of farm villages the latter marked by clumps of trees scattered over the landscape our boat moves along slowly and we frequently get off to walk on the banks we meet chinese craft here and there and now and then harness ourselves side by side with the yellow-skinned boys and help them drag their little vessels along we cross the wide huang and reaching the yangtze take a steamer for a trip up that mighty stream the yangtze is more than three thousand miles long and ocean vessels can sail over its course to yi chang which is one thousand miles from the sea it is a great water highway to the interior of the country having so many tributaries that it might be called the mississippi of china as we sit on the deck of our steamer in the lower part of its course we can see the masts and sails of boats moving across the green fields the country is cut up with dikes and canals quite as much as is holland there are vast territories where nearly every man's house can be visited by boat and where the people seem to live on the water china has so many canals that its navigable streams form the principal highways the largest cities stand upon the banks of the rivers and there are industrial centers at every few miles each city has its peculiarities some such as hangchow and suchow on the grand canal are noted for their manufacture of silk and others like han kao are great iron centers nanking which is on the yangtze several hours by rail from shanghai has streets as wide as those we saw in peking while in canton on the pearl river a great business city with more than a million people the streets are so narrow that we have to crowd against the walls to let the wheelbarrows go by one of the finest cities of the country is shanghai situated not far from the coast on the wampoa a branch of the yangtze it is the chief port and might be called the new york of china it has fine foreign buildings great factories devoted to the making of cotton and silk and other industries of almost every description we can get some idea of the trade of a country by a look at its shipping china is said to have more boats of one kind and another than all the rest of the world put together it has lines of steamships on its principal rivers and native craft on most of the streams at the walled cities which we pass on our trip up the yangtze there are forests of masts belonging to boats of all sizes descriptions and shapes we see chinese junks with wide-spreading sails ribbed with bamboo and fishing craft whose sails are shaped like the wings of a bat catching the slightest wind as they move along we go by barges loaded with merchandise and canoes sculled by chinese who stand at the stern there are craft shaped just like a slipper which are used as dispatch boats and go very fast we see queerly shaped boats with paddle wheels on their sides turned by men a half dozen coolies doing the work of a small gasoline engine and are now and then stopped by beggars who sail through the canals from one town to another to ask alms of the people the beggar boats lie at anchor while the men go upon shore and visit the villages some of the beggars are lepers and we pay them well to keep out of our way the chinese rivers are infested by pirates we carry guns and have a little cannon in the front of our ship here and there at the edge of a village we see a boat or ship cut in half and stood upon end we are told that it once belonged to some thieves or pirates and that it marks the place where they were beheaded the boat having been erected as a warning to others there are also police boats and customs boats whose sole business is to collect taxes on shipping as we continue our journey we discover that every locality has its own kind of boats the only thing in common being the eyes painted on each side of the prow the chinese have a tradition that a boat must have eyes to see its way through the water therefore the small boats are given small eyes the cargo boats eyes a little bigger while the eyes of the ships are as large as a soup plate during a trip on the pei river i once happened to hang my feet over one of the eyes of my boat whereupon the captain rushed up and begged me to move said he in a peculiar english 
that some chinese use in talking to foreigners boat must have eye no have eye no can see no can see how can go this eye superstition is prevalent among the common chinese indeed when the first railroad locomotive was built it existed to such an extent that the workmen insisted that an eye should be painted on each side of the smokestack in order that the engine might be able to see its way along the track it is safe to say that many millions of chinese are born live and die upon the water the boats carry numerous people and they are not only the homes of the sailors but of their families as well on the pearl river near canton there are said to be three hundred thousand people living upon boats of various kinds on the larger craft the children swarm and we shall see them playing about upon deck the little boys often have barrels about a foot long and six inches thick tied to their backs the barrels have closed heads top and bottom they are intended as life preservers for if the children fall overboard they will keep them afloat until their parents can pull them out of the water among the queer boats of the pearl river are those devoted to the rearing of ducks and geese a business in which the chinese are exceedingly skilful they hatch goose eggs and duck eggs in baskets of chaff placing them in rooms heated by charcoal to just the right temperature when the little goslings and ducklings come out of their shells they are carefully handled and for five days are kept away from all noise they are fed upon rice water and then on boiled rice and at the end of two weeks are put on these boats and made to shift for themselves the duck boats are built like rafts with coops hung to the sides in these coops and on the boats the fowls stay a single vessel often holding as many as one thousand young geese or ducks the boat is now rowed up and down the creeks until it comes to a low swampy place here the owner opens the coops and lays down a board which extends from the boat to the bank the ducks immediately run out and cross over the board and begin to hunt in the mud they dig down into it with their bills and pick out all the worms and snails they can find after they have fed several hours the captain of the boat makes a peculiar call and the ducks obeying his voice return to the boat they come quickly too for the last duck always gets a blow with a stick when the ducks are grown the captain carries them for sale from town to town in his boat there are foul markets in all the cities in which thousands of geese and ducks are sold every day End of chapter 19chapter twenty of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chinese farms and farming t in our travels through interior china we often find the farmers irrigating their fields the country has highlands and lowlands and there are many irrigated regions the chinese rivers are mighty earth carriers they bring down from the mountains the richest of fertilizing materials being often so loaded with mud that they turn the bright blue of the pacific to a dirty yellow for a great distance on each side of their mouths this is especially so with the yangtze and the huang the effects of whose waters can be seen for thirty or more miles out from the coast the waters of the yangtze at certain times of the year are as thick as pea soup they are loaded with a silt which makes the land over which it is spread very rich and the farmers use every means possible to save it they lift the water in tightly woven baskets to which ropes are attached and empty it into canals so that it flows over their mud-walled fields they also scoop up the mud from the small streams and canals and use it many of the odd irrigating machines are worked by cattle or men one is a rude horizontal wheel the cogs of which move in a small upright wheel to which is attached a chain pump as the wheels turn the pump raises the water and empties it into a trough from where it flows to the places desired a water buffalo drags the first wheel around and thus gives the power other machines are worked by men who walk up the outside of wheel-like frameworks stepping always upward 
their weight keeps the wheel moving and thus raises the water when we reflect that there are tens of thousands of men and animals working this way we can see that a great deal of irrigation goes on the chinese are a nation of farmers but their tools are rude and they have but little machinery almost every kind of labor is still done by hand the ploughs are so poor that they do little more than scratch the soil and such crops as wheat oats and millet are weeded and hoed nevertheless the soil is so rich in some places that one acre produces enough food for six persons the farmers know the value of fertilizers and everything is saved for the purpose potato peelings the hair cut from the heads of the family the remains of old houses and all sorts of manure are saved to enrich the soil we see boys and girls raking over snow and even pulling the stubble to use in this way or for fuel there are but few cattle in china the chief pasture lands are the slopes of the mountains which cannot be employed for cultivation we often see water buffaloes at work in the fields they do all sorts of heavy farm labor such as ploughing hauling tramping out grain in threshing and turning mills of one kind or another these animals look somewhat like cows having flat horns which extend almost horizontally backward from over the eyes their bodies are covered with a thin growth of black hair which stands out like bristles and they appear clumsy and awkward in north china the ploughing is done also with ponies and donkeys in a field near peking i once saw a man and a donkey hitched up side by side dragging a plough the sweat was rolling down the man's face and he bent almost double as he toiled trying to keep up with the donkey near him i photographed a man who had harnessed up his two sons and a daughter and was ploughing with them he was pushing hard upon the plough handles and the children were straining as they tried to break up the ground when the man saw me taking his picture he became angry many of the chinese believe that photography is a magic art and that the photographer can if he will compel the person whose picture is taken to obey him and may cause him all kinds of trouble the ploughman evidently believed i was dealing in witchcraft and he tried to seize my camera to break it i jerked it away and rushed for my donkey he ran after me but my chinese servant came to my aid and held him so that i was able to mount and make my escape the crops raised by the chinese are of many varieties the land is one of several climates and it yields almost everything grown in the united states large crops of rice tobacco and cotton are raised in the south while wheat millet buckwheat and maize are the staple grains of the north opium is produced by cultivating the poppy and in the yangtze valley there are millions of mulberry trees whose leaves feed the silkworms the best of the chinese tea comes from south of the yangtze where it is raised in vast quantities the tea leaves are plucked three times a year the first picking which consists of the tenderest leaves is the best and fast ocean steamers race with it to europe knowing that that which is first sold will bring highest of prices now that the trans-siberian railroad has been built much of this tea goes northward to it and thence on to europe at hankow situated on the yangtze about seven hundred miles from its mouth we find large steamers taking on cargoes of tea boxes and also factories in which the leaves are being prepared for the market the tea is fired or roasted in much the same way as we saw in japan after firing the leaves are picked over by women and girls who sit at tables with the tea on trays before them their hands move rapidly and they show great skill in picking out the best leaves we can see their bound feet showing below their trouser legs as they work after grading the tea is packed in lead-lined boxes for shipment abroad we are interested in knowing how brick tea is made there are many factories at hankow the business being largely in the hands of the russians in making brick tea the leaves are ground to a powder and then steamed until mushy and soft they are now put into moulds of the size of a brick and pressed into shape tea of the finer varieties is made into small bricks of the color and size 
of the cakes of sweet chocolate sold in our confectionery stores the brick tea is pressed so hard that it is almost impossible to scratch it with a knife and it must be broken before it is used it is carried on camels into the desert of gobi and on the backs of men to tibet where it is so much in demand that it often passes as money each brick being worth about fifteen cents the tibetans cook the tea with butter into a soup like that we saw in mongolia among other centers for the shipping of tea are shanghai hangchow canton and fuchow the exports being several hundred million pounds every year much of the product is used by the chinese themselves a great deal goes to great britain and russia and also to the united states the amount we annually receive being some millions of pounds another important plant found in all parts of south china is the bamboo which grows to a height of from forty to eighty feet having a hollow stem with joints here and there we all know it in our cane fishing poles the bamboo belongs to the grass family it grows wild in thickets and it is also set out in plantations at the start it looks much like grass but it rapidly grows taller and thicker until certain varieties reach the height of a six-story house and at the base the thickness of a telegraph pole some kinds will shoot up several feet in one night there are two or three score varieties of bamboo some green some purple and some yellow or black the bamboo is almost as important to china as iron is to us it forms the roofs and walls of some of the houses and also the pipes through which the water is carried it is used for making chairs and beds and all kinds of furniture it is employed for buckets and cups and even spittoons its splints are woven into baskets and matting and they form a framework for umbrellas lanterns and fans which are covered with paper it is woven into hats to ward off the rain or sun and of its leaves a raincoat is made it is the old man's staff the blind beggar's stick the rake of the farmer the foot rule of the carpenter and the pen of the scholar it is the pillow of the women at night and their comb when they rise ground into a fibre and soaked it forms a pulp from which the chinese make paper and it is also employed for ink wells and vases the tender shoots are dug up and cooked as a vegetable and the seeds are ground to a flour it is also used to make medicine the green buds and coating inside the stems being employed for this purpose end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b industrial china we are surprised at the industry going on among the chinese they start work at sunrise and often continue their labor until long after dark their cities are beehives of industry in some sections every little house is a factory in which most of the work is performed by hand labor they weave cotton and matting make fans and umbrellas and also paper furniture and earthenware of all kinds thousands of blacksmiths are pounding out tools upon anvils and other thousands are engaged in woodworking of various kinds every town has some streets in which they make nothing but coffins and others where they are manufacturing brassware and copper utensils including funeral urns china has a population three or four times as great as our own and it produces almost everything it consumes the country has long been one of house industries that is a land in which most things are made in little shops or the houses within recent years however modern machinery has come in and we now find factories going up in all the chief centers at hong yang adjoining hong kau on the yangtze about seven hundred miles from the coast are iron and steel works that would be considered extensive in any part of the world more than twenty thousand men are employed in the smelting furnaces and rolling mills there and they are manufacturing steel of all kinds for the new chinese railways china has great beds of coal iron and limestone and it can produce steel almost as cheaply as we can 
its mineral deposits are about the richest on earth and it will some day have a large export of machinery modern mills for spinning and weaving cotton have been established at shanghai canton wuchang and other popular places and more than a million spindles are whizzing around making yarns the common people dress almost entirely in cotton consuming so much every year that it has been estimated that if it were all in one piece it could carpet a roadway more than twenty miles wide reaching from new york to chicago moreover the chinese use cotton for wadding their garments and all their winter clothing is padded and quilted the heating arrangements are poor and they put on suit upon suit as the weather grows colder this necessitates a vast deal of cotton most of which is raised at home although some is imported from america and india during our stay in shanghai we visit the mills they are large brick structures on the banks of the wampoa river not far from where it flows into the yangtze the machinery is as modern as in our own factories and the scenes are the same save that the workmen are yellow much of the labor is done by women and children and we see boys and girls who toil all day long for less than one cent an hour we find more children at work in the silk mills they tend the machines which reel the fine threads from the cocoons and spin them into raw silk shipped to america there are many large silk filatures as such mills are called and also modern factories where the thread is woven into cloth the chinese were the first to weave silk and china has always been one of the chief silk-making nations until recently their weaving was done on the rudest of looms and many such are still in use in all the silk districts at nanking we visit the works which were established to make silks and satins for the emperor the threads were twisted by hand and were woven together on wooden looms operated by the hand and the foot ribbons are still made in the same way on small looms by women and girls of the silk districts who work at home often spinning and reeling out of doors but where does the silk thread come from it is made by the silkworms which spin it for the cocoons in which they are changed into moths rearing the little worms and properly feeding them to get the cocoons is one of the important industries of china it is so highly thought of that the empress herself had a silkworm nursery where upon certain days she fed the worms as an example to the other women of china we can learn all about such things by visiting the silk districts along the yangtze river we shall find that rearing these little creatures is by no means an easy task the worms come from the eggs of the silk moth which are laid on coarse sheets of white paper a single moth often lays five hundred eggs and the paper must be prepared for it and left in just the right place the eggs are of about the size of a mustard seed and are of a pale ash color as soon as they are laid they are put in a cool chamber until the time comes for hatching they are then brought into a warm room and placed upon mats on shelves of bamboo the temperature of the room must be just right and this is tested not by a thermometer but by a man who strips off his clothes and comes in naked by the feeling of the air upon his skin he can tell whether the room is cold or damp and if so he heats it with stoves within a few days the eggs hatch each producing a little black worm as fine as a hair this baby worm must be fed and like most babies it starts life very hungry for the first few days it has a meal every half hour and this consists of green mulberry leaves cut into small pieces as the worms grow older they are fed once an hour and when they are about full grown they need only three or four meals a day the silkworm reaches its growth at thirty-two days after hatching in which time it takes a sleep every four or five days it is at the twenty-second day that it begins its last or great sleep where it raises the four parts of its body and continues to rest in that position during each sleep it casts off its skin sleeping on until a new and larger skin is matured when full grown the creature is about two inches long and as large around as a man's little finger its color is amber it is now ready for the work for which it was made 
it takes no more food and begins to spin the fine silk thread from its mouth fastening the thread to a frame upon which it has been placed as it spins it moves its head from one side to the other continuing this motion until its whole body has been enveloped in a tightly wrapped silk shell or cocoon the spinning requires from two to five days and when it has finished its little silk house the worm again falls to sleep it is now carried with its sister worms in their cocoons to a slow fire of charcoal or wood and placed so near it that it dies by the heat after this the cocoons are put into water this loosens the fibre and the women and girls unwind the silk by means of rude machines worked by the foot and hand or by the machine reels of the mills in both processes several of the fine threads are twisted together until they form one thread large enough for weaving much of the silk is reeled into such thread for export but a great deal more is spun and woven at home into the caps coats gowns trousers and other clothing used by the chinese there is one industry for which the chinese have always been famous this is the manufacture of porcelain indeed the word china which is commonly used for all porcelains comes from the fact that such ware was long ago shipped from china to europe the chinese histories say that their people were making porcelain seventeen hundred years before christ and marco polo relates that he saw it manufactured in china twelve eighty a d and that it was then shipped all over the world all porcelain is made of a fine white clay known as kaolin which is found in many places china contains great beds of it and that of such a quality that it makes beautiful ware the clay is dug out with pickaxes and carried on the backs of men to the mills where the stones and sand are washed out the pure clay is then ground fine and worked over by men or buffaloes who tramp about through it mixing it thoroughly it is then ready for the potter who moulds it into cups plates saucers and other vessels using the potter's wheel to aid him after the vessels are shaped they are dried in the sun and then fired or baked in ovens which use wood as fuel the fire is moderate at first but it is gradually increased until the whole interior of the oven turns to white heat this heat is kept up for three days by which time the china should be thoroughly baked the fire is then allowed to go out but the oven is not opened until twenty-four hours later for the china must cool slowly and the cold air rushing in may cause it to crack as soon as the china has cooled it is handed over to the painters often a dozen men will work on one piece before it is finished one artist will sketch the design and others may fill in the trees flowers butterflies birds or human figures of which it is made after this the ware must again be fired to fix the colors this is done in circular ovens heated by charcoal end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b curious chinese customs in this our last day among the chinese let us consider some of the things in which they differ from us we call them heathen and they look upon us as little better than savages they think we are impolite and pity us because we do not dress act and live as they do when two americans meet they clasp hands but when two chinese friends come together they shake their own fists at each other and if they are going in the same direction walk off like geese single file we cut our fingernails short but the chinese let theirs grow and with them long nails are the sign of a lady or a gentleman the ladies sometimes have silver shields which they wear over their nails to prevent them from breaking all those who do not work with their hands are proud of their nails and the scholars officials doctors and other professional men often have nails from one to six inches long i met a chinese merchant in canton who could rest the palm of his hand upon his chin and scratch the back of his neck with his nails the chinese do not kiss they seldom embrace 
and in bowing to one another they bend down almost to the ground we take our hats off when we enter a house but the chinese keep theirs on we ask first after the wives and daughters of our friends the chinese consider such questions an insult and the girls of the family remain out of the room when men call on their fathers or brothers chinese girls are not courted marriages are arranged by parents through professional matchmakers and a husband seldom sees his wife until he is wedded the wife is the slave of her mother-in-law who has the right to whip her if she does not obey in china the men wear the finest embroidery and the high officials have their hats decorated with feathers and wear strings of beads around their necks the men have long stockings while the women go about in short socks the chinese women wear pantaloons above which is a coat coming halfway down to the knees when in full dress the men wear gowns which reach from their necks to their feet a chinese gentleman's shoes are of cloth ours are of leather and we black them all over while he whitens the sides of the soles in our army the officials are known by epaulets on their shoulders in that of china the rank is indicated by buttons worn on the cap and by feathers fastened under the buttons the chinese women are proud of their small feet and many of them bind the heel down into the foot by tying the four small toes under it so that it looks much like the end of a club such binding begins at three years of age and except when removed for washing the bandages are kept on from that time until death this compression causes terrible pain and if too tightly bound the foot may break in two at the instep and the bones come through the flesh we wear black when we go into mourning but the chinese wear white and when the period of mourning has half passed away they put on a garb of light blue at the beginning they send out mourning cards printed on white paper although the ordinary color of the visiting card is the brightest of red by and by they distribute other cards upon which is printed grief not so bitter as before and when the morning is over they give a feast to their friends the chinese begin their books at the back instead of the front and in dating letters they put the year first and then the month and lastly the day their newspapers begin on what we should call the last page and the columns run differently from ours they have theatres but the performances are carried on during the daytime and they are given watermelon and pumpkin seeds at which to nibble as the acting goes on they have queer kinds of food among which are shark fins and a soup of birds nests they boil their bread instead of baking it and their eggs are eaten hard boiled they pickle eggs in lime and the older such eggs are the better they like them they never drink cold water and even their wine is served hot they eat from tables as we do but use chopsticks and not forks to convey the food to their mouths most things are served in small porcelain bowls the meats being cut into cubes they drink tea and wine from cups and both are served hot and sipped these people do not wash their hands before dinner but a servant brings a hot wet cloth to the guests at the table and they rub off their hands and faces with this passing it from one to another they seldom wash the whole body and it is said that many of them receive but two baths while on earth one at birth and the other when prepared for the coffin the chinese baby has no cradle it is strapped to the back of its mother or that of a servant when it first begins to walk it is given a pair of knit shoes with a cat's face on the toes this being supposed to render it as sure-footed as a cat the boys fly kites but the best kites of china are owned by the men who enjoy them as much as the boys cock-fighting and quail-fighting are common and in some of the cities we see men kneeling down on the streets about little bowls in which crickets are placed these insects are urged on to fight by being tickled with straws and they fight until they are dead a good fighting cricket is valuable for high bets are made as to which will conquer one of the most striking features of china is the terrible poverty of the lower classes nevertheless the people are economical and we are surprised at the saving we see nothing is wasted the stubble of the wheat oats and millet is pulled from the ground and even the leaves of the trees and weeds 
are gathered for fuel the poor man does not build a fire if he can help it and even the rich use clothing rather than fire to keep out the cold in south china rice is cooked in large quantities and rewarmed when eaten by pouring hot water over it to save making a fire the hot water is often bought from hot water peddlers who are to be found on the streets of the cities some towns have a hot water store for every twenty families at the restaurants all scraps of food and even the tea grounds are saved the water in which vegetables are boiled is sold for feeding hogs and the bones are cut from meat that they may be used for making chopsticks many of the chinese cities have public cook shops and soup houses which are kept by charity during the winter but are shut up as soon as spring comes when the poor as we say of horses are turned out to grass for they can then live on green things and wild fruits indeed the necessities are so few that for two cents a day a man can buy enough to keep him alive and upon four dollars a month can support a family and lay something aside for his funeral there is no country whose labor is better organized every trade has its union and the bankers and merchants have their own guilds the working classes have always opposed new inventions and the officials have been afraid to let them come in on account of the trade unions they delayed a long time making railroads for fear of the cart drivers boatmen and wheelbarrow pushers but now they see they must have these things if they would hold their place in the world as a nation for the same reason the chinese are establishing factories for making all kinds of goods as well as gunworks which are turning out arms and munitions of war they are now building their own railroad cars are opening mines and introducing many new industrial methods they are a people of great skill and in time they will be sending their manufactured goods to all the world's markets. End of chapter 22chapter 23 of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b foreign colonies in china we have left the mainland of china and are now on the little island of hong kong at the mouth of the pearl river almost touching the coast most of its inhabitants are chinese but the island belongs to great britain having been given up by the chinese in eighteen forty one after a great war between the two nations it is one of several portions of territory which china has been forced to part with either forever or on long leases to certain other governments with which she has warred we saw something of one of these territories on our way from korea to china when we landed in manchuria at dalny or as the japanese call it Daren, and another during our visit to harbin in the northern part of that country the southern part of the leong tung peninsula in manchuria was leased to russia by china and when the japanese conquered the russians this land came to japan the city of Diren has many japanese stores and the great fortifications of port arthur are manned by japanese soldiers the japanese control the southern half of the railroad which runs north from Diren to mukden and on to harbin and the russians have certain privileges in northern manchuria and over the rest of that road crossing from Diren to chifu on the shantung peninsula we can visit Wehiwe, another bit of territory leased to great britain and sailing on around that peninsula we reach sing chow on kiao chow bay which was built up by the germans having been given to them in eighteen ninety seven on a ninety-nine year lease because of the killing of two of their missionaries at that time sing chow was only a poor fishing village and but few ships came into the bay it is now a fair-sized city with good buildings and modern improvements introduced by the germans it has wide streets and good stores great docks have been built on the bay and steamships are to be seen there at anchor a railroad has been constructed far back into the interior in nineteen fourteen tsing chow was captured by the japanese who had previously advised germany to withdraw so that the settlement could be returned to china 
another territory which china has lost to the foreigners is macao on a little peninsula south of hong kong this is a beautiful place belonging to the portuguese and it has been occupied by them for several hundred years it is one of the oldest foreign settlements in china but is of minor importance as to commerce and trade in addition to the places which belong to these great powers of europe and to japan there are certain sections or concessions at all of the chief ports where the foreigners dwell and to a great extent govern themselves and those chinese who dwell in the concessions in peking the legation quarter where the ambassadors and ministers live has foreign soldiers to guard it in tientsin the english russians germans french and japanese have concessions so that the place contains several little cities in addition to its many chinese and in shanghai a great rich foreign settlement with fine streets magnificent buildings costly residences and large hotels has grown up the city has newspapers printed in german french english and chinese it has big stores filled with european goods and many banks and exporting houses its life is a gay one and the people have cricket golf and ball clubs and there are schools of all kinds there are similar concessions at hankow suchow canton and other cities but let us take a look at hong kong when the chinese gave it to england they probably thought it worth nothing it was all rocks and hills and its population comprised only two thousand poor fishermen the island is so small that we could walk around it in less than a day and it is composed of bleak and bare hills one of which is four thousand feet high and so steep that it is almost impossible to climb it except by the cog railroad or in chairs swung between poles which rest on the shoulders of half-naked chinamen nevertheless this little island is now one of the richest most populous and most important parts of the world it has a greater trade than any other city of asia more than twenty thousand vessels of one kind or other enter its harbor each year and the tonnage they represent compares favorably with that of new york or london moreover railroads are now building in all parts of china which will be connected with hong kong by its ferry to the mainland and its trade will grow greater and greater it has already large factories including cotton mills flour mills and sugar mills and shipbuilding yards it has magnificent buildings surrounding the harbor and great structures rising in terraces from street to street on the slopes of the hills the population of the city which is fast approaching a half million is composed largely of chinese but there are thousands of europeans and americans as well as a garrison of soldiers sent out by great britain most of the soldiers are europeans but some are sikhs from east india tall broad-shouldered black men who go about in odd uniforms with great turbans covering their heads there are also chinese and european policemen we land and take a ride through the city its name is victoria although it is usually spoken of as hong kong we are carried ashore in a sampan a little boat sculled by a woman with a baby tied to her back by a square of cloth inside which the little one lies its bare legs sticking out at the front the woman stands up and sways to and fro as she handles the oar which moves the boat onward there are hundreds of such boats in the harbor upon which people live and it is said that the boat population numbers forty five thousand nearly every boat has three or four children we are met at the docks by coolies with chairs they take us through the streets from terrace to terrace and finally leave us at the railroad station from where we can ride to the peak this is at the top of a hill eighteen hundred feet above the level of the harbor and we have a beautiful view we can see great steamers bearing the flags of all nations coming in and going out on their way to or from europe we can see our own ships which have come in from the philippines and an endless number of chinese junks with odd masts and sails it is the situation of the island and the harbor which makes hong kong so valuable to england it can be easily defended and it lies at the southern gateway of china 
where the ships from europe first come with their goods end of chapter twenty three